Hello, I'm Cosette Griffin Kramer, and the first thing I want to say is the thanks to the Museum of English Rural Life in the University of Reading for hosting us, and to Ollie Douglas and Isabel Hughes for all the work organizing. Engaging with the living heritage of local breeds in museums, living history sites, and a bit more, especially heritage breeds in their environment, just like local cuisine, that enables their preservation and promotion, with special emphasis on how animals collaborate with humans. A major question in this whole ecosystem is the transmission of skills, a giant topic that we can hardly touch on today. I'm going to concentrate on examples from Europe and the United States, and have added the UN Sustainable Development Goal Number 17 logo, representing partnerships for the goals, because museums' activities involving local animal breeds lead to so many of the other SDGs. This will cover a variety of domestic farm breeds with a special emphasis on animal energy in agricultural work. Although it will center on sites of various kinds that keep living animals in both urban and rural settings, this in no way hinders museums from effectively showing animal breeds without having them on site. At our host, the Merle in Reading, the standard absolute unit is a ram that demonstrates just how much stories bring life to museums and their collections and highlights the museum's links to the Breeds Association directly responsible for the Exmoor horn sheep. Now to move on to a national agriculture and food museum that has vast premises dedicated to animals. That is the National Museum of Agriculture and Food Industry of Poland near Schreniawa, uh, in Schreniawa near Poznan. Schreniawa is the first European institution, as far as I know, to hold a series of international conferences on live animals and museums, and with the explicit intention of promotion and public education on the subject of native breeds. The museum also possesses rich archives and can trace imports for breeding programs from all over Europe. Today, they have a very rich collection of animal collaborators housed in cutting-edge comfort, about half of them native Polish breeds. Needless to say, when the Polish zoo technician team wanted to arrange a European tour to two museums in Germany and one in France, it was easy for us to do this, and they were also able to meet the president of the French Society of Ethnozootechnics, and a recent, a recent issue of their journal has an article entitled Preserving Domestic Biodiversity from Threatened Species to Species of the Future. Far smaller museums can also do big things. For example, the Ecomusea Musée de Perche in that region of France is specialized in a festival event for the world famous local horse breed of Perchuans every year in mid-August. That attracts Perchuan owners from all over Europe and beyond. There are also good reasons for a museum not to utilize local breeds, as at the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Kloster Loch in Germany. Their work centers on 8th to 9th century farming, and they chose working oxen of the Raetian grey breed, whose wither size corresponds to iconographic doc documentation of the period. This means that their oxen fit the reconstructed tillage implements and enable analysis of how those worked with the animals and in the soil. And of course, the oxen are also stars in the museum shop as stuffed animals. Moving out of Europe to one of its colonial extensions in North America, the historic site of Mount Vernon, first President George Washington's home and farming estate. All of this is thanks to Jeanette Berenger of the Livestock Conservancy, who was there for the launch of the U.S. Postal Service, Service Heritage Breed Stamps. And Mount Vernon exhibits today several heritage breeds like the Jackstock Jockey and the Narragansett Turkey. The Livestock Conservancy consults widely with museums and historic sites in the search for as near authentic as possible representatives of breeds, but we'll see later that this can be far more complicated than a casual visitor might imagine. On with the wealth of links the IMA network often enables. When Jeanette was searching for original photos of the Bordelaise cattle breed, Denis Richard, director of the Ecomusée de Marquez in France, was able to send her professional photographer's work, including fly masks for the cattle and COVID masks for the handlers. Remaining in France for the moment, I would like to step out of the box a bit and say this festival represents 
a living history for the future site that pops up every four years as a massive event for stock breeding and alternative agricultures. In 2018, 60,000 people dropped in to visit for the eighth festival over four days, and with good reason. The Nantes breed numbers stood at over 150,000 in 1949 and had crashed to some 50 animals by 1985, near extinction, when the flame was taken up by some very obstinate farmers. A book dedicated to the Nantes breed has a chapter entitled Cattle Breeders in Search of Meaning, which sums up what the whole event is about, promoting local breeds, solidarity among farmers and their friends, and inviting a guest of honour. The FET regularly hosts a guest breed from another French region, as the Basque Swine in 2018, and the draft animals demonstrate work and equipment every single day of the festival. Local breeds associations like the Crapau play a central role in the organization. Let's go back to the Postal Service. Stamps are important. They're meant to mark mines, even if only fingertip, fingertip size. So it is no surprise to see local breeds highlighted along with local landscapes, just like the local cuisine with local products as promoted by slow food. And this link with the environment should be quite clear by now in the examples, large and small, of museums and living history sites. And now we can go on to another example that bridges museums and people concerned by the promotion of local breeds in several European countries. This is the mainly German collection of friends called the German Working Cattle Group with strong attachments to local breeds, local harness, and the breeds often on the German red list of endangered animals. They have two kinds of meetings at the home farms of individual members and in some of the large open air museums in Germany, such as you see here. One of the museums is located in the heart of the German capital in a totally urban site in Berlin. This is the Domaine d'Alm, where the farm manager, Astrid Masson, keeps species on the national red list, endangered and heritage breeds, and is an active member of the German Rare Breeds Promotion Group, among the breeds of the Red Upland cattle from mid-Germany that you see here. First, meet our heroes, Emma on the left, Astrid on the right, who is also author of a remarkable manual on working with cattle in museums. The archaeozoologist, Eva Rosenstock, proposes that many of the prehistoric European monuments were in fact due to field clearance by uh, animal traction and of course oxen, the field clearance and glacial retreat debris. She gave Emma and Astrid an assignment for the working group meeting and here it is. It's a one ton monolith, a one ton monolith. Emma had had a calf 10 days just before this and Astrid checked with the farm veterinarian that the mother could undertake a slightly ambitious task. And of course, as you see, she did it. Now, away from the big city for a final stop at one of France's finest eco-museums, certainly the most magical, the Ecomusée d'Alsace. For just a glimpse of the theater of agriculture, an ever-evolving program of real field, garden, and vineyard agriculture, which is the living center of public education, and a showcase for skills from milking to plowing using local breeds. It is also the yearly meeting venue for the French Ox Drivers Group, with the Eco Museum's consultant expert ox driver, Philippe Kuhlmann, and his Vosges cattle breed that uh, is triple purpose. Philippe is among the very few, if perhaps the only breeder in France, who insists on farming with no motorized implements, though with mechanized equipment, often of his own invention. As he likes to say, never buy a tractor and you will instantly have a lot of very good ideas. The cattle you see here have the typical Vosges markings, though the red patches are characteristic of only 5% of this breed. The Alsace Open Air Museum would dearly like to have some Zundkau goats, once common in southern Alsace. We consulted with Astrid in Berlin and the German Rare Breeds Promotion Group to ask about where to find a Zundkau, and the answer from her colleague, Carole Stier, was very revealing in a nutshell. If you don't have the original herd books, you won't know what they were aiming at, and the generational turnover in goats is so short that there may be very little left of the original targeted genetics. In short, the Alsatians may never find their goats in any officially certified form. This brings us back to the vital role that linkage with outside experts and other institutions can play in museums, historic sites, and parks of all sizes. So we can go back 
to Jeanette Berenger of the Livestock Conservancy to look at a question people rarely think to ask about, money. Is it possible to estimate the value of an animal working for a museum? Leave it to an American judge. A visitor to the North Carolina Outer Banks Wildlife Preserve in the United States shot dead one of the wild horses there and nobody was pleased, so the culprit was taken to court. After a detailed inquiry, the judge in charge of the case decided that the horse's individual value over a lifetime of service to local tourism, with 2,500,000 visitors per year to the islands, came to the tidy sum of between 15 and 17 million dollars, or 14 and 15 million euros. Alfam, the Association for Living History Farming and Agriculture Museums, has long been one of the IMA's most vital partners, and during their conference in June, veterinarian Barb Corson discussed domestic breeds, domestic breeds conformation, and the enormous genetic plasticity involved when animals are selected for specific traits without foreknowledge of knock-on effects. The spectrum of what IMA members and friends institutions engage their public with runs from proposing a cuddly toy as a souvenir right across to expectations of this sort of in-depth learning experience about the debates in stock breeding genetics. Some of the people and places we have encountered here tell us much about the importance of local breeds, especially as an integral part of their environment, about working towards food security within broader sustainable development goals. That some farmers and much of the public are in search of meaning in their relations with animals. Among many angles of approach to helping institutions thrive and promote their relevance, dealing with rare local and heritage animal breeds is one of the most fruitful, and the people in museums you've just met, so briefly, prove it. <laughs>